Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome. Is it a good morning? I have had coffee spilled all over me twice this morning. It's so hard. Was it good coffee? It was fabulous coffee, but my clothes are not appreciating it. I'm sorry to hear that, Reverend. I'm sorry to find pat so. myself down. Um, I love. All right, welcome oh to the conference gosh. on S23, which was started in your neck of the woods, um, came to us um, while the four of us uh, served on the, the committee last week. Let's just go quickly around to make sure that we all know who each other are. Representative Tom Stevens. Mary Hooper Montpelier. <laughs> John Kalaki from South Burlington. Michael Sorok in Chittenden County. Senator Ballant, Wyndham County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Former House member. Former House member. <laughs> I am. I am the only former House member on this team, which makes me specially qualified to be on this conference. <laughs> so with, um, with everything in front of us this week, I was hoping that we would be able to just dive right in. Um, I think we both have expressed our um, body's respective desires to see this pass. And so it's just a question, I think, of um, being across the table and getting a clarification of what actually we're talking about. Yeah. I presume it will be a little bit less complex than the, than the family leave bill, but there are plenty of complexities within the differences in the two bills. So. Um, Damien and then Joyce, if we could get, um, Damien, if you could just lead us through the differences and also um, kind of educate us on some of the changes that we put forward that may not be relevant any longer, whether it's because studies have been done or other language has been, has been put into the bills, into the statute someplace else. And then Joyce, if you could run through, after Damien, the, the issue brief um, that you were able to get done last fall. That would be great. Was it fall? Good well, suggestion. Damien, all yours. Thank you. I'm just pulling up the document on my iPad. Um, for the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. And uh, you should all have a copy of the side by side in front of you at this point. And you just pull it up on my iPad and I will walk through it with you. Um, <laughs> what you may have uh, Thank you, Senator. I apologize. Um, Senator two. Clarkson here, I have another Oh, we have an extra copy. So, here. There we go. Okay. We got it. All set. You can have a copy. Here, you can have your copy back. And we have an extra copy over there. So um, just to, to bring us up to speed, um, the, House Pat, the House's proposal of amendment to the Senate, Senate's original proposal of amendment on this bill was to go with a minimum wage increase of two and a quarter times the CPI, or five and a half percent, whichever is less, until the minimum wage is equal to or greater than $15. Um, and then after reaching $15, the minimum wage would return to its increase by the CPI or 5%, whichever is less, which is the current increase that we've been seeing year over year. Um, <clears throat> the House proposal also established tip pooling requirements that were consistent with federal regulations and provided uh, that the uh, minimum wage increase, that two and a quarter times multiplier, uh, could return down to just the CPI in any year in which both state sales and use tax revenues decreased by 2% or more relative to the prior year, and the state revenue forecast had been reduced by 2% or more. Um, so that, that's what's commonly referred to as an off-ramp um, or a- Recession um, trigger? It, yes, it's a recession trigger there. That's designed to kind of mirror recession. Uh, it's something that's done in New York and California, or that is in their minimum wage laws. Um, Damien, may I ask? Yeah. Um, we know that New York has several zones for minimum wage increase, so is that true in each of the, the zones? 
Right, so in New York, they can make the assessment with respect to any of the zones, and that comes out of the understanding that the economy in the city yep. may be different from the economy upstate. Well, particularly in the Adirondacks. I mean, north of Albany. And again, that was done in a climate, that was written in a climate last year where there was, from the fiscal offices yep. on down, of, of pretty more than lukewarm yep. fears of a recession on the horizon, which, according to the fiscal stuff last week, seems to be less right. urgent. Less urgent, but... Always on the horizon, there. but just less urgent than it okay. was a year ago. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, in contrast, what the Senate sent back at the end of the session last year, um, did away with the increase to $15 and instead came with an increase uh, to $11.50 on this past January 1st and $12.20 on next January 1, and then returning to the CPI increase thereafter. Uh, so the, that's kind of the core of the bill. The other pieces in here, in the House version, uh, there were some changes in the definitions. There was a clarification on the definition of student to be consistent with the current Department of Labor interpretation and uh, the additional definition of uh, TIP because of the TIP pooling requirements. That is all out of the Senate version. Um, the next, in the House version, there were two sections, sections three and four, that dealt with the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Those sections complemented uh, what was put forward by the House in a bill um, to address that issue and then what eventually went through in the appropriations bill at the end of the session, uh, generating, I believe, something like $7 million in additional funding for that. And this was designed to complement that. Uh, so that has already passed through. It is not in the Senate version. Section 5 of the House bill and Section 2 of the Senate bill required a report on increases in Medicaid reimbursement rates that would be needed to enable the payment of minimum wage to employees of certain Medicaid participating providers and independent direct support providers. The Joint Fiscal Office has prepared an issue brief on this subject. <coughs> um, they did not have some of the teeth in that bill uh, or in that provision requiring providers to report, um, but Joyce can talk more about the, the data that was provided in that report. Section 6 in the House bill created a study committee to examine the possibility of creating a separate minimum wage that would increase more slowly than the standard minimum wage for employers that provide certain benefits to their employees, uh, such as health care benefits above a certain level. Um, section 7 would have required legislative counsel. Oh, that section is not in the Senate bill. Section 7 of the House bill would have required legislative counsel and the Joint Fiscal Office to submit a report regarding potential alternative mechanisms to the CPI for indexing the minimum wage to inflation after 2024. That did not make it into the Senate bill. Uh, just as an aside, and I've said this to both committees of jurisdiction, this is something that uh, any member could request from us at any time um, if you were interested in that. So um, section 8 in the House bill was section 3 in the Senate bill that created a study committee to look at the impact of altering or eliminating the basic wage rate for tipped employees. This is known as the tipped wage. Um, so currently that's 50% of the standard minimum wage. Uh, and then it would have also looked at eliminating the sub-minimum wage for secondary school students during the school year. Um, I think everyone here is familiar with that, but just as a reminder, under Vermont law currently during the school year, uh, secondary school students are subject to the federal minimum wage, which is generally 725, but can be lower in certain instances. Uh, and then during the summer, the break between school years, they're subject to the Vermont minimum wage, which is 1096. Uh, and this has been a source of confusion for employers uh, in recent years. Right. Um, David, so I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but can you just give us a reminder what would be the, you said there are some instances in which employers could pay less than the federal? Yeah. What are those? So they would still be paying the federal minimum wage, but under federal minimum wage law for uh, employees under, I think it's under 20, I'd have to double check. Okay. 
Um, so you can pay job. a sub-minimum wage for a probationary period at the beginning of their okay. employment, yep. and that's set by federal law. Okay. So, and there's also a training wage. That that's what they get. Four twenty-five an hour, right? right? Isn't there a four twenty-five an hour? I can't training. remember the rate, but yeah, there's a training wage for employees yeah. under a certain age. Right. Um, that's well below the seven twenty-five an hour. Great, thank so you. It's not only confusing, but difficult for people who are actually trying to earn money to go to college, which is wildly too expensive. So I mean, there are lots of issues that are packed into that. Right. If if we establish a different rate, our policy. Over, I just wanted yeah. to make sure I wasn't over that. Yeah, so the, the way the federal wage and hour law works is it sets the, the floor, and states can enact, the, enact laws that are equal to or more protective of employees. So, so you can, a higher minimum wage, um, greater overtime uh, provisions, that sort of thing, can all be set at the state level. So for instance, we have, we have, um, our minimum wage is now 1096 because we have what we put into law over time. New Hampshire does not have a minimum wage, so they default to the federal minimum wage as, as their minimum wage. Um, Just to match what their high school students are being paid. So I think that that's, I mean, it, it, the longer we do, with the frequency that we do to, to go into the statute, it's become clear that there's certain aspects of it that are outdated. Yeah. Um, you know, the spread, the difference between our minimum wage and the federal minimum wage has grown over time. So yeah. I think that was the thought behind um, behind having that study, just to say that this is this. I mean, I can't imagine that someone would turn and say, I'm going to hire somebody for $7.25 an hour when they can work next door for eleven ninety six an hour. That's the market at work. But the fact is, is that they can. Right. And then in terms, if I can just jump ahead to the agricultural study, which is next, we've learned the same issues. It, the, right. the agricultural workers can be paid the federal minimum wage, but there are market issues. Sure. There are <clears throat> contract issues for um, for other workers who come in. There's just the different levels. And when asked, when you see the list of exemptions after a while, you finally have to just ask, well, why is this so? And so that's what this was for. We, we approached the, agricultural com the House Agricultural Committee and the department last year, and they both expressed an interest in having a study done so that they, because if you ask the Department of Agriculture, they'll give you the 42 different answers that they aggregate from people. Sure. But this is just a way to try to get an understanding yeah. of it so that we can move forward with, with better information. So much of the statute was written long ago. Okay. Could we have um, in the Senate version, I know it's the same as the House and what we sent over at the end, but in our original bill, did we have a study on tip wages in there? You did. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that was something that uh, the Senate added in the original amendment that they sent over to the House. Okay. So the House kept that, the House added the agricultural wage study, which was then kept by the Senate and what it sent back. How the about Senate. the sub minimum? The sub-minimum wage for secondary school students, I believe that was in from the Senate um, and then kept by the House. Remember, we had a fairly robust conversation about a universal wage rather than a tip wage rather than a differential. And we had that great professor from the West Coast talk to us about the, all the challenges that tip wage earners face. Okay, so. So um, Joyce just pulled up the federal regs for me. Um, while I was speaking, and I can confirm that it's for workers under 20 years of age, the first 90 days under federal law, you can be paid 4.25 an hour, and then you go up to 7.25. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about the working group to examine the wage and hour laws for agricultural workers. Before you leave that, that yeah. so that makes the issue of when a school student becomes even more relevant. If it could default during a vacation period to that training wage, right? Well, so it's the the way the department interprets it is they it's during the school year and regular vacation periods, and the department interprets that as basically from when you start school, uh, whenever the first day of school is around Labor Day, to the last day of school in June. That 
that window there and all the vacations in there are subject to federal minimum wage. So that could be as low as 425. That could be if you're within your first 90 days. Yep. Um, so. Re regardless of the fact that we have a different federal, I mean, a uh, different minimum wage. Right, because the way it's set up is there, we have, I think, I think seven exemptions or groups that are exempt okay. from the minimum wage overall. <laughs> Agricultural workers are one. And then secondary school students during all of the school year and regular vacation periods uh, are, are another. And that group, the department, because the laws are construed to be protective of workers, they construed that as narrowly as possible to be protective of, of student workers. So during the summer, if you're a high school student who just works summers, it's just the state minimum wage. If you work uh, during the school year, your employer could choose to go back and forth between them, or they could choose to pay you the state minimum wage. Um, what they can't do is pay you the federal minimum wage year round. Um, so, those two studies, both sides agreed on them, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, the language uh, was kept the same um, by both parties there. The uh, next was requiring legislative council to prepare draft legislation to modernize the wage and hour statutes, including identifying obsolete or out of date provisions. This was left out of the Senate uh, version, um, but Two members of the House who are part of this conference committee here, Representative Black and Representative Stevens, both requested bills that included that work. Uh, so that is, and that was presented to the House General Committee last week uh, for a bill introduction. So that is not necessary at this point. So can I ask you a question and go back to uh, Section 2? Uh, uh huh. Can, I, I know you and I had talked about this in your office, and I walked away thinking that that was put in as belts, uh, belts and suspenders, so measures, yes. uh, and that that is actually no longer necessary because of what the feds have done. Reverse so the, the tip pooling requirements, um, originally, uh, if we go back to last biennium, what had happened is the federal government had proposed regulations that included a, a very large loophole that would have allowed <laughs> yep. uh, employers of tipped employees who do tip pooling to actually keep part of the tip pool uh, rather than distributing it to employees. Uh, Congress, uh, and this it's rare that I get to say this, but Congress passed a provision that corrected that issue. Um, and so they actually corrected the issue so now the tip pools, you can pool between the front of the house and the back of the house, um, provided you're paying the federal minimum wage as your base wage to everyone, so at least $7.25 an hour. But it prevents uh, managers or owners of restaurants and other places that do tip pooling uh, to actually keep a portion of the tip pool. It has to go to the employees. And that was the primary issue that the Vermont was concerned with was that issue of um, of uh, having some of the money go away from employees. Some of the initial language on this required that it stay with the traditionally tipped employees, but the latest language follows the federal guidelines where you, if you pay at least federal law, uh, minimum wage, you can pool between the front and the back of the house. So dishwashers, people who are cleaning yeah. salads. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that was, and that's, a, I mean, that's part of a bigger overall issue about about compensation in restaurants and what we're used yeah. to. But this, again, this goes to tip pooling only. This does not affect restaurants that, this federal law does not affect restaurants that tr work our traditional way, which is to say you can pay 50% of the, pay 50% of the minimum wage as a tip credit, if you will. Right. Um, yeah, it does not affect them. Um, so they have to have a, a tip pool and they have to pay a base wage to their tipped employees that's equal to or greater than the federal minimum wage. Um, so you're already talking right now, our tipped wage in the state is uh, $5.48. So you're already talking someone who's paying $1.75, $1.77 more than the tipped base wage in the state as a base wage to their tipped employees. 
Um, so if they go back down to the state's base wage, they're not eligible for that federal tip pooling provision anyway. And because it's more protective than uh, the state law, we'll follow it without requiring us to adopt anything. Um, all we can do is we could adopt something that's more protective of the tipped employees. Um, but at this point, the House's latest proposal did not do that, and so the Senate pulled out that language um, because it's not necessary to accomplish that. Right. Okay. But the but the language about the student <coughs> was also taken out. Yeah. So and that is not necessary at this point because that's the current interpretation by the Department of Labor. Um, so uh, what? The, the only benefit of including that definition is just clarity on the face of the statute. Um, so that's, that, that definition didn't actually change the status quo, it just put it in the statute um, so that there is, excuse me, clarity kind of um, for employers who might not go to the department's wage and hour regulations um, or might not call up the department for guidance. And that. I, and so, that that issue would be part of a study, no doubt. Yes. If we right. Study. And the study, if the study comes back with a recommendation to change the student minimum wage or eliminate that exemption, that would all be dealt with at that point. So that's an issue that would be front and center in that study. Okay. Thank you. And so I didn't mention this at 1030. But we need to be done today, this morning at 10, I'm sorry, at 9.30. So we need to be done by 10.30. So as do we. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and so just keep that in mind with our conversation. Um, that would be great. And then we will try to schedule reconvene. something else for later on today, reconvene later on today. So Joyce, please um, let us know. Actually, before we move sure. over to Joyce, can you just um, summarize? What is no longer necessary because of changes in statute and where there is similarity between the two? I think it, maybe it's obvious, but just starting no at the top. So yeah. sections three and four mm -hmm. um, are no longer necessary because that was addressed in last year's budget bill. Mm -hmm. uh, section two, um, assuming the tip pooling requirements stay out of there, uh, is not um, is not really necessary unless you wanted to get that clarified definition of student in there. But if you're planning to address that through the study committee, it's not necessary. Um, and then on sections six and seven, six, uh, that's a difference there. And that's, um, that's something that you'll have to decide. Section seven, um, is not really necessary because you could request it on your own, right. but if you wanted to require it to be done as part of the legislation, you could include it. Um, and then section 10 is not necessary because those bills have been drafted. Um, right. So so section five. Section five is in both bills. Oh, well that is really something for Joyce to address yeah. whether her work this summer and the issue brief she she wrote uh, covers that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce. Thank you. Um, so I don't have copies of the issue brief regarding the survey of wages for healthcare workers paid through Medicaid, but I believe that you've all received it. Perhaps we have it right here. Oh, you have it right there. Oh, terrific. Excellent. Ron is unbelievable. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to run through this quickly. The bottom line is that we tried very hard to get as many jobs reported in terms of minimum wage, I'm sorry, in terms of hourly wage and hours worked as we could. We hired a contractor. We worked for three months to try to collect wage data. It turns out that we got wages paid for 6,631 jobs. We believe that there are about 7,200 workers who are paid $15 or less in the state 
paid through Medicaid in the healthcare sector. Um, the jobs do not translate to the workers because many workers have more than one job. For example, the, the folks paid through ARIS, the direct care workers, might have four or five jobs in a single pay period. So we are not able to, to estimate the cost to the state of raising the minimum wage for those workers directly from the wage data. But um, the issue brief does contain information about the distribution of those wages. And you can see um, about 45% of the jobs for which we got information do have hourly wage of 12.50 or less. But I would caution that those are heavily weighted by those heiress workers, the direct care workers, because we were able to get complete uh, payroll data, 4,500 jobs um, for that group of, of workers. So the other part of our study was to try to update the inputs uh, for estimating the cost to the state of raising the minimum wage for these healthcare workers. And there we relied on uh, help from some of the trade organizations um, looking at nursing homes and visiting nurses and hospital workers and all uh, adult care facilities and so forth. So that we think we now have a better estimate of the cost on average of raising minimum wage for these healthcare workers. Now I say on average because there's no way to directly target the money to specific providers. For example, we know that um, providers in the Northeast Kingdom and in southern parts of the state pay less mm -hmm. on average than providers in uh, Jimin County, for example. And with a statewide reimbursement rate, for Medicaid services, there's no way to, to send more money to the providers who need more money. It would just be a, a similar percentage increase across the state. So that's a very quick review of what we've done and uh, some of the insights that we've, we've learned. Are there any questions about all that? Uh, I have one. Um, so the analysis uh, does not um, provide, at least in this issue brief, the amount of money the budget will benefit by in terms of increasing the minimum wage that is and correct, reduce, for revenue. reduce benefits and increase taxes. Because I remember when we did it for the child care, there was way more than enough money there to pay for the increase we want to put in the child care. So I have two additional handouts that I can discuss today if, if you like. One shows the new inflation projections that we just received from Tom Cabot and Jeff Carr, the new consensus inflation projections. And just as an illustrative path, I've used 11.75 in January 2021 and 12.55 in January 2022, simply to illustrate what something would look like. So I have a handout there. And I also have the handout that is the, the table of all the numbers from the issue brief for the minimum wage. And this simply moves everything forward by a year and again uses the 1175 and 1255 um, dates. So shall we, shall we hand those yes, out? Yes, please. Okay. And while we're doing that, Joyce, just Damien may mention that, that the study language that was in the bill, that was in the House version of the bill, gave you teeth to, to get more information from agencies. But simply doing the issue brief, you, you asked and they either return your request or, or not. Is that right? Like, the, the, um, what is the difference between having the language in the report versus what you did? So I will confess I haven't read the language recently, but we did everything we could to get data. We had, what, over 200 providers who cooperated and sent their data. Um, there are something like 8,000 providers in the state who bill through Medicaid, and we know that because we got the Medicaid um, budgets for all the providers from AHS. Uh, many, many, many of those have very small Medicaid billing, probably under 1,000, maybe under 2,000, but we sort of ignore those. Um, and we tried to get the largest providers um, in terms of their Medicaid billing. <coughs> So we, we tried our level best. Um, so is, but is this a sufficient, I, 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 I was treating this as a sufficient substitution for what we were asking for if this bill had passed last year. Is I think that, that is true. Okay. Yes. John. 
Joyce, you know, when I, I was looking at your, your study here, thank you. Um, I, when you said 45% um, in 201250 or less, I'm thinking, well, that means 55% are already paying over 1250 Yes. In, in this group of 7,000. And then on page five of this study, um, the VNA looks like 75% of their employees are being paid over 12 to 15 an hour, right? Yes. And then on the next page, the cumulative distribution of wages on page six, again, 75% of reported jobs are being paid over 12 15 an hour. Yes. Is that? Yes, that is true. But again, we did not get a representative no. sample of all those jobs. You I, understand that. I, so this I, is I for understand the, that, the, the jobs, geographic right? differences. Right. But it shows in some places, the marketplace has moved that ahead. The needle. Yes, and in large part, that's because people start at a low wage, and after so many months, they move up to a higher wage and so forth. Uh, the thing to remember there is there, there's so much turnover right. in this industry that some, some of these providers have 40, 50 percent turnover, yes. so many people are starting at the low wage for, let's say, four to six months. But Before one of your findings is when you talk to people, they said that raising the minimum wage will actually help with retention. Yeah. They think it will help someone. Yes. Yes. Okay. The thing to remember there is that, of course, the minimum wage rises for everyone, including workers at McDonald's and workers at the yes. retail store and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. So they're still competing to Got some it. extent, yep. but they okay. hope it will help with hiring and retention. Thank you. Correct. Okay, so let's um, look at so who? Well, no, if you were in the middle of a thought, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to turn to the next. So. Okay. Um, you said that the data is heavily weighted toward the heiress yes. folks. Yes. And so what's the significance of that? Are they uh, paying less or more, do you suspect? Yes, so you can see on page, page four. So there are two types of heiress workers. One type is paid hourly, and the second type is paid by the day. And folks paid by the day generally spend overnights with patients. Maybe they're doing hospice care or uh, you know, other kinds of care that require overnight work. And so you can see that, um, let's see, about 50% of the hourly jobs are paying Twelve fifty or more, and about only seven percent of the daily jobs, once you convert to an hourly rate, are paying twelve fifty or more. Right? Sorry, only seven percent. Well, it's ninety-three percent right. are paying at or below twelve fifty. But the, the folks who work overnight may be able to sleep some of those hours and so forth and so on. So their pay rate is different. So I've converted to an hourly rate here. So yes, okay. 4,500 of the 6,600 jobs are the heiress jobs because we got complete data for that payroll provider. So that means two thirds of those jobs are, are influenced by these folks that tend to be paid lower. And of them, of that 4,200, 400 are these daily workers Correct. versus? Well, it, it, yeah, this is 4,200 who are paid hourly and about 400. Oh, okay, so yeah. 4,600 right. total 4, from Eris and got it. Right. Joyce, yes. um, do you have a, a sense, uh, when we did the minimum wage summer study committee, we looked at this population, obviously not in the same kind of detail as you did, but we came to the conclusion that in the first couple of years, uh, that increasing the minimum wage wouldn't necessarily have a significant impact on these heiress workers or other workers, especially when you factor in the fact that they, in 60 days or 30 days or whatever, they get a bump in their wages. And substantially, they were still ahead of what we were projecting for a wage. But we did identify that as years three, four, and five, we had a problem potentially looming that we need to. Do you think that was, in general, given all those factors, a fairly accurate statement based upon? Um, I, I think we didn't have complete information, and we may still not have complete information, but we have a little bit more information that says turnover rates are so high that there are many workers who are paid uh, below 11.50 or below 12.50 an hour. 
Um, so because 40% of those folks are turning over every year, starting a new job every year, there are that many people in the workforce who are earning the very low wages before they get bumped up, right? Right, but the, the target wage of the increase in the minimum wage was higher than that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, right. Okay. So uh, may I just tag under while we're asking Joyce about what she considered and didn't consider? Uh, it's great to have the revenue data uh, in one of your handouts here. Um, what I don't see is, uh, okay, so you have net reduction in federal funds to the mm -hmm. Vermont economy from decrease because the impact in what we'll save eventually over time, again, it's going to take a while, uh, in increased income is, of course, a, a reduction in dependence on assistance programs which we would hope would not only reduce federal funds, uh, federal um, money, but also state money. And I don't see any uh, net reduction in state money here. Is that? Yeah, here. So it's that's all here. Is that, Where is that? Yeah, it's up here. That's, that's all I mean. It says, oh, it's including both. Yeah. OK, great. Sorry. I just saw net gain. Right. Hoping to also see net reduction. Great. Did right. you want to walk us through there that? Yeah. 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 Yes, so let me just start with the minimum wage path that has the small table and the little chart. So there have been changes in the inflation projections that will affect both current law and um, any new minimum wage path going forward that is indexed to inflation. So the chart at the bottom here just shows <laughs> that the current projections, I'm sorry, the contrast between the blue and the green doesn't show up better. It was perfectly clear on my computer screen, of course. Blue is uh, on top. The blue, the blue on the right is on top, yes. Um, so you can see that it's, they're just a touch higher this year than they were last year. And you can see the big surprise was in uh, actual inflation for 2019. The consensus had us up at 2.5% and it came in at 1.8%. So that was, the, mm. that was the big surprise. But um, some of you may have seen some intermediate projections from this summer. We had some August projections, and those were actually a little bit higher than the current December 19 projections. So don't be confused. OK, so here we have on the top, we have the path under current law. So uh, the consensus projections would now say that by 2025, current law would get to 1230 by 2025. Uh, of course, that would have the same real spending power uh, in 2020 dollars as the current wage 1096. It's simply indexed to inflation. Uh, if if we think about the the illustrative path 1175 and 1255, then you can see that we would get to 1346 by 2025, um, and that of course would have the spending power of um, 1226 once you adjust for inflation. Go Assuming ahead. that we adjust for inflation. Well, no, no, I'm just doing current dollars. Oh, so, oh, oh. so I went from 1096 and then assume that the uh, 1175 mm -hmm. and 1255 happens and then assume that it's in, in indexed by inflation. Well, that's what I mean. That, that's, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. Yes, absolutely. Right. So you would get to 1226. And there's a note underneath here, underneath that table, that says that um, current law gets to 1381 in 2030, but the 1175, 1255 path, indexed to inflation thereafter, would get to 1511 in 2030. Jeez, crap. By then, livable wage will be, you can just imagine. So we, under the 1175, 1255, and inflation thereafter, we would get to approximately $15 in 2030. And the bill that the uh, Governor Vito, and I remember we were suggesting that if we didn't do anything, it would get to um, $15 in 2034. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, well, and, and, well, let's finish this. I think, I, I mean, the differences between the two, I mean, I think our, I think our plan ended up getting there given all of the different parameters of the CPI and to, you know, the, the algorithms that were created in order to push it forward, got us there by 2026 or 2027, I believe the original Senate bill that came over to the House got us there by 2024 or 2025 with, with set increases up until that point. 
and up to fifteen dollars up by, I think by twenty twenty four. Right. Which um, again the, the the committee version agreed with that, and then in the House there was the battle over with the, re the recessionary language became very strong influence on, on how we determined what we came up with. And then you returned two years right. that keeps us on a certain path right. that's close to what either one of the proposals would do, right. but acknowledges that we actually want to try to have something that we can <laughs> get signed. Right. And you felt that was more palatable. Is that a way of looking at it that there's not a there's not a desire to like do two years and then let go out to 2030, but that, but by putting an increase for two years, the the feeling was, was let's get this going yeah, again. Let's give it a jump start. <clears throat> I mean, I did, I, admit, did I represent that pretty accurately? I mean, because I just I just want to I don't want to misrepresent that. Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize that what the Senate sent over also was a year ago, and we were thinking that inflation was going to be about 3% at that point. Uh, so obviously there needs to be some adjustment from what we had over a year ago because we've lost a year. So. Shall we turn to table two? So these are the, the fiscal numbers that come May I just say something sort of, may I just say one thing, Tom? Uh, I mean, for those of us who are also working so hard on housing, which is all of us, it is still beyond frustrating that these numbers do not reflect the cost of living in, and, and our livable wage. And that what I hope we can do as a legislature over time is repair the increasing differential between the livable wage and the minimum wage. And as we all know, Franklin Delano Roosevelt meant the minimum wage to be the minimum amount you needed to live on. And after having our head in housing all year, all summer and fall, to be looking at these figures when we know they don't even pay for a single bedroom, one family rental apartment in Windsor County is just beyond frustrating. So while I'm appreciative of all the work we've done, I just also am reminded <laughs> that we have so much more work to do to make Vermont and uh, bring our wages up so that we aren't 18% behind the rest of the country in our wages and help our people live uh, with dignity in this state. So anyway, I just had to say that because here we are still talking about these amounts that aren't even going to pay for a rental apartment. Sorry. In Representative Pulaki. Well, if I could just uh, add a little bit on that because um, the the, I don't know if everyone saw the Women Work and Wages in Vermont study. The, yeah. Um, and women are a disproportionate share mm -hmm. of Vermonters who make less than $11 an hour. Mm -hmm. yeah. The median age of women earning under $11 an hour is 38 years old, and 28% have earned college credits or yeah. college years. So this is a gender issue in our state as well. So I think we're all on this that we have to increase this. Um, and then you break down disability and people of color, and it's, it is unbelievable. So, we, right. mm -hmm. so I, we're all... Yep. We're all with you. I'm just... I just had to more, say more. that as we noodle these numbers, which are already inadequate. Yep. And, and, okay. and to be... No, and just to be clear, that that is that feeling is shared by the House mm -hmm. on many frustrating levels. I think it's just really... Uh, and that's why we tried... That's why we put together the language about the future of compensation, yeah. because, because of the difficulties in all of this. And um, this... I, and I think a minimum wage, we're seeing an economy that's heated up, so very less people are being paid the minimum wage, but then you have statistics that show that the people who are, I mean, all, all these things feed into this, and we are, um, this, there's never a beginning and there's never an end. And I think this gets us, this gets us across a line with the acknowledgement that there's always miles to go. So what matters here, I mean, we all care deeply about what has just been articulated, but none of it matters if we don't get this across the line. Absolutely. So we've already we lost need, time. Yes, yes, we have. So let's, here we, we need to be cautious about that and what we're willing to do. And I just want to say that if you look at Joyce's chart here, we're still talking about helping 40,000 
Vermonters and giving putting another $121 million in their pocket. Yeah. It is still a meaningful bill. It's yeah. over a shorter period of time, but it is still meaningful. So I don't want to lose sight of that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So, sorry, so that's a, just a long way to get to yeah. chart two, yeah. and yeah. I'll just point out it's 1018, yeah. so. Okay. Okay, so table two is simply an update from the uh, fiscal note that was issued at the end of uh, last session. And I've simply moved everything forward by a year, updated to $2020, and used the 1175 and 1255 path. So these numbers should look very familiar to you. Uh, they haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, I will say that they are preliminary in that I haven't gone back to check the newest inflation estimates and how those might affect these numbers, but they will be close. Um, so you can see, uh, let's see, we've just walked through the the jobs and the initial income gains of the low-wage workers. So the net fiscal gain to the state, again, looks at how much more money is coming in and how much less money is going out the door for, right. for um, support <coughs> programs and benefit payments. Uh, so that's the 9.4 million that you see in 2022. The net reduction in federal funds to the Vermont economy comes from decreased federal benefits and increased federal taxes because of course higher incomes mean higher taxes for, right. for some households. So that would be about 39 million less coming to the state. The approximate net disemployment, which means the number of jobs that we would be down because of the increase in the minimum wage is about 280. And this is according to modeling done by Tom Cavett for JFO. And that's jobs in the same way that you just described them before that there is, it's not the people in those jobs, no, it's the jobs themselves. Correct. Yes. Out, out of how many jobs? How many jobs? I think it's over 300,000. Oh, it's certainly more than 300,000. In a year, we know that 380,000 people work in Vermont. And may have them work multiple jobs. And may work multiple jobs. So yes. again, 380,000. So the tax department gets 380,000 W-2s. So that means a, a, a wage report for unique Social Security right. numbers. I can't do math. So yeah. that this is You're on the less than I was gonna say I <laughs> <we> should all <laughs> be frightened, <laughs> yeah. So this is less than one percent. Far. Yeah. Yeah. Far less. Far less. less. It's, yeah. it's it's actually a tenth point. of a percent. Yes. And I feel like this yeah. is this number is less than it was when we were looking at this year ago. But yeah. so what, what relative to the minimum yeah. wage going up to fifteen dollars an hour certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's yeah. And you can see the long term outcomes at the bottom of table two there. Uh, the net annual long-term disemployment, the number of jobs that we would be, be below business as usual. Okay, so think of business as usual, number of jobs, and we would be down about 500 in the long term. I remember a quote from Tom Cavett that was really stuck with me from the summer study when he looked at these numbers, and people were trying to get him to gauge the economic impact, and people were focused on the number of jobs, part-time or whatever, that might be lost. And so there were similar proportional, he said, but uh, using these numbers, he said, if I had to look at the fact that I'm a low-income worker and 280 jobs might be lost versus 40,000 that may see gains in their income, those are odds I would take. Yeah. Not only that, but it gives <coughs> employees an opportunity to work for a wage that is that is more attractive or let go of the job that is less attractive. So. And then there's the demographics that we hear about where people, the, the baby boomers, if you, which is the bulge in our demographics is lessening in the workplace. And so as people leave the workplace, that's the people part, not necessarily the jobs part. Um, right. So what do we have left, Joyce? I just want to be conscious of the time. Um, right, so you can see disemployment as a share of total jobs is the 0.1% that is similar to the short-term effect. That's on the chart at the bottom there. And disemployment as a share of minimum wage jobs is 0.8%. So that says that yeah, it's the minimum wage jobs that would be affected the most. Uh, the effect on the level of Vermont GDP is very, very small, 0.08%. And again, that's 
business as usual, that line, and they go down 0.08%. Yeah. Very small. Very modest. Okay. Well, keeping time in mind, um, are there suggestions that the Senate would like to make a proposals, or shall we meet, find a time this afternoon to trade proposals? Or where are we right now? I think there's, I mean, Proposition 2 conversations started on the floor, yeah, so. You better get. Um, and we don't why want to lose that. Why don't we come back to you with some proposals, either orally or we may even have them written up? That's fine, I think. Um, so do you have time between, um, I'll say as early as 12.30 and two, between yeah. the, before, the, before the budget address, um, do you have time? Uh, I haven't spoken to my conferees here, but I guess I just have to ask Becca whether, what time our caucus is coming from. Yeah, so we're, we're starting caucus at 12.10. I try to get them out a little bit before one. So, before and that. the budget address is at 2, and we have to, we have to be in our place, in our seats yeah, by can. 10 of. Yeah. What time did you say the caucus would like to be over? Shortly before one. Oh, like okay. Twelve fifty. So why don't we? Why don't we? So can we do make a proposal to meet at one o'clock? Or one to one fifteen. One fifteen. Is that what you're one fifteen yeah. to trade proposals and have further conversation? Sounds good. Uh, Damien will be slightly delayed. Explain that. All right. We okay. are on the record. Uh, Great. Thank you, everybody. Welcome you. back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Um, I met with Damien and asked him to put together a written uh, conference, video conference report for your consideration. And he said he probably could get it done by 1.30. It wouldn't be with, it wouldn't be edited, but he would get that to us. So I can explain what's in it and talk about it. And hopefully by the time I'm finished and you're done asking any questions about it, he'll be here with the, with the copy. Um, so, Based on our um, where we where we thought inflation was going, and circumstances have changed since last May, we're suggesting that we go to twelve dollars and fifty-five cents in two years, uh, and that would be uh, going to eleven seventy-five in year one and twelve fifty-five in year two. Um, and that would keep the same C CPI as what's in the bill keep, in, the, keep in the, the law after, now? After or? that, we keep the same CPI that's in the bill. Okay. So it's a straightforward two-year proposal, just like what the Senate... Right. Just the numbers are slightly yeah. different. Um, as far as the... Uh, I think if we went through everything Damien said this morning, it seemed to me there was only two real studies left in the bill, or two remaining issues left in the bill. One was the agricultural study and the tipped employee study and student study. Um, and what you're going to get from us is a proposal that has Joint Fiscal and Legislative Council do a significant workup answering the same questions that's in the study committee as opposed to establishing a formal summer study committee. Uh, in the Senate, uh, formal summer study committees are frowned upon, or at least uh, more rare, in uh, uh, second year of a biennium. And uh, having served on a number of these around these kinds of issues, uh, for instance, on the minimum wage, it's a bear in terms of the amount of time that needs to be expended in terms of all kinds of witnesses that come in and um, I'm not sure it adds a lot more than what Damien can provide. I've seen his reports that are really detailed, and you can spell out what you want. You want to know what other states have done, what the impacts have been. He can collect that data. He can get you know, position papers from the various advocates and attach them to the thing. He's not going to be able to make a recommendation like a summer study would be, but he is going to be able to give all the information we need be to help the legislature go forward. Uh, in the future. And um, so uh, I think that uh, we would prefer to go that route as opposed to the route that was proposed for both of these, which was two administrative administration officials 
two legislators and two stakeholders uh, being part of the thing. I think we've also seen, I think you'll agree that these summer studies tend, to, despite our best efforts, tend not to get started until September. And we're in an election year and, you know, people are going to be pulled in different directions uh, in terms of November. And so I think this would be a cleaner and, quite frankly, it could, it could be a more productive way to go. So that's what, it's going to be a very simple proposal to you and uh, I'm not sure if you have any questions or the one way to bring it comes with the language. So does it propose, who, who makes the list of questions? I mean, I know that we have certain things put out here, but who I told I told him to take what was in our, both of our bills in terms of a, legis, uh, a summer study committee and try and address those same questions for him to answer, to provide the backup information or hit uh, legislative council and joint fiscal together. So basically, he would operate as, I mean, not unlike what he did with the bill the, the, that he already did work on by request, which was the modernization, which we originally had in here as a, as a report request. Um, I made it a, a bill request, and he did that kind of work. So you're thinking along the same lines that if we ask him, as you said, for in the information that we need to then pick up the policy and move forward. Yes. Rather than have a committee that hears all that and then puts out a recommendation. I would encourage you, if you want to, as you think about this, I had a piece of legislation uh, a couple of years ago dealing with uh, misclassification and the use of debarment procedures that were not getting done in the state of Vermont and asked in legislation we asked him to do a report right the quality of that report was incredible uh, right. what he put together it was 35 pages long so the question I would have for him and Joyce and JFO is just their capacity to take this on of course, that's hard to say because we don't know what else we right. are asking you know, what else are we putting on. But I think we need to be attentive yes. to the fact that it's a good these question. guys aren't magicians. That's a good question. I, I anticipated it, and yeah. I think he would agree that he would probably have to spend more time staffing the committee than he would in writing the report. <laughs> and, and Joyce, you don't know because you haven't seen what we're necessarily asking, but this capacity create, does that raise a flag for, on your side of the shop in terms of the ability to produce? So we have to be careful about how much we take on this summer because we are a limited number of people, but um, we just don't know what else is coming down the pike. So I imagine this would fit in for the summer, yeah. It's a provisional, yeah. okay? Yeah. Is that a provisional, yeah. a conditional? Yeah. It's not a bright red. Well, we no, work we, yeah. in a minimum wage study. We work Joyce and Damien yeah, pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. And so what would be the... And they wrote the report, too. <laughs> what would be the report due date? And I, I think only in terms of our... I, I don't know what our... Um, in the House, I'd have to ask. But we always operate with such a... The, the Senate has such a limited... You have a deadline for bill requests that are pretty... Early, it's but not in the first year of a biennium. We're, we have we can introduce something. It, it's a much more liberal f deadline in, in the, the first, first biennium. It's, it's, it's the second week of first week of December that it's you not have the first week of December. I think we can introduce things actually. So in, I mean, in order to right. in order to feel right. like we can ask for a bill right. that will utilize this as a report for its statistical right. backup. Exactly. Well, we should ask him. I think I think in the first year it's, it's January 30th for us. I think that's all. I actually don't think we have a deadline. No. No, we we he'll, have. He will know. We have, but I know that there's been a desire. To, but it also goes pretty late in terms of. In the I mean, there are many times where we don't get bills in the first year of the biennium until almost crossover, just because the deadline is so late, and that's why they moved up the deadline this year to try to make sure that all the bills are out. For the second for the second session, and enough time for us to actually maybe act on them. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? So, in one of the reports that the House was looking for 
um, there were, in addition to members of these bodies, in state, uh, you know, executive people from the executive branch, there were also represented a uh, representative employers, and I assume employees probably. Right. And I'm curious if we lose any richness from having that conversation by having those reps as part of this. I understand the proposal. I'm just thinking about mm -hmm. what did the alternative structure bring, and was there some richness to what the report would say by having employee and employer reps? Well, he can't. He can't take testimony. Yeah. Right. But he can ask for position papers from the advocates and ask questions of the advocates on both sides and somehow incorporate those as not necessarily facts, maybe he defines them as facts, but maybe as this is what we heard from this people, these people. Um, so I think that's... He can that's ask any, yeah, of course he, he can, can ask anybody for, you know, for information right. without, he, he will pass the information on as if it were a book report, I guess yeah. is... I understand that. Yeah. I'm just reflecting on the fact that it's a different conversation yeah, when you have representatives of those groups at the table. Yeah. So in thinking think, about the questions yeah. that need to be asked, we need to make sure that you're getting that information. Well, right. I think that puts the onus on us when we consider the bill anyway, regardless of whether there was a summer study committee with, with in all the stakeholders present. I mean, obviously, you know, we tried to call in as many people as we could on on this bill. Right. So it's the same idea. It's just making, I think it's acknowledging that their voices had not yet been heard in ways that matter. I mean, the advocates, yes, but to hear the voices um, would be important. And that's on us. That's on us to follow through. So you'll have, a, were we to wait for Damien until 1.30 or four would he? Minutes. He'll, He'll be here in four minutes. If it's, uh, we could check, I can run down and see if. I, I can text him. No, it's, he, he's. I think he's, he's either on here two minutes. But you're probably going to want to look at it anyhow. Yeah. Well, so are we, because I haven't seen the final draft, but it's not Damien. Uh, but, um, and now we could, well, we could pop, set up another meeting later today. What do you say? Yeah, um, yeah, we should, we should, well, we'll take some time amongst ourselves to think about the number and, um, and just discuss what we think about this idea. I mean, I don't, on the face of it, I, I agree that it is difficult to get these committees up and going, um, but just want to talk to conferees and see where we are with this. It's, I mean, the, we're seeing the information. I mean, the, we, I mean, this gives us an opportunity to also uh, another bill that's already in the works because it's an opportunity to think through this more if we find that right. that offer isn't sufficient. But I believe we'll, we'll talk about it. And, um, May I offer, please? Uh, you know, as a, as a freshman legislator, um, and there were 40. That excuse is wearing thin with you. I know. Uh, <laughs> particularly given the number of commentaries. <laughs> so, but it, here's, here's I, I, I hear what you're saying about the studies um, in the election year. But my experience in our committee is when people who were working with tipped wages, men and women, in their lived experience of the sexual harassment they have to go through and their experiences of it. That, and then people who work with farm workers and say they work with visas, it's this amount, and if they give them housing, it's this amount, really made us think about we really have to get a fuller picture of how Vermonters are compensated in this state, all, all of this. And so uh, I think the studies to me were like, okay, this gives us an opportunity to go deep and really go into lived experience and understand all these aspects of people who are working uh, on farms. Um, and I will have to ask, or I have to be reassured by Damien that that actually can happen in a study where no lived experience can be informed. Well, I would say that that's not fully okay. fair. I, I think that 
you're, you're right, John, I think we would have a lot of that in the summer study. But I also think we can get that in our committee as follow-up um, okay. to the report, and we can bring that into committees as we weigh these bills. Okay. But the other, the other thing is all, all, of, all of the reports he'll get from, let's say, VBSR or the chamber or uh, from Migrant Justice or whoever is going to weigh in, the restaurant associ you know, associates, like the wonderful woman on the West Coast, all of them will be lived experience. Every report he gets will reflect some aspect of lived experience. So I'm not afraid he's not going to get lived experience. It's our job then, as we listen to the testimony and as we explore and do the do deep dive, yeah. to bring in those voices to inform us of the stories that have uh, informed the reason for their advocacy. And I think, the but I, but I think you make a good point. You know, the middle ground might be to in collecting data from these advocacy groups to encourage them to submit, you know, yeah. anecdotal testimonials as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Story. not the same as seeing person live, but the committees themselves will be very well prepared and as, it, as opposed to us diving in right now. I mean, you'll have a lot of background behind you, and I'll get you a copy of this, this uh, misclassification report. It was pretty, I mean, he does a great job. And I think one possibility, and you know, when we when we've envisioned the larger study that we have the bill for, is to just the way you phrased it makes it fit into there. And I think what you're saying is that at the very least, the technical information that Damien can put together provides a base where actually witnesses wouldn't have to repeat themselves or you know go through it. Just. It, it could potentially lead to just where it is about the lived experience rather than... Um, I think we can so. get the best of both. Well, let's, let's, when John has an opportunity to talk to Damien... Um, Ron, we'll, did you call Damien off or is he still coming? Because uh, I have his... I can call no, him. I, I just, I think if he, I mean, really... You the, he would have been here if he, yeah, if he, he had done right. I, I would say that if we can, Ron, if we get, if you see Damien, like if we leave now, because we have to just, I mean, I can just, have time. I've got him pulled up here. But it's, um, we need to get a copy of it. We need to take five or seven minutes or so. We need to see it as well. Yeah. It's but I haven't seen the final version. As yeah, well. but I, we, so we want to take some. We're making a decision. We just need to get the. Right. We need to get the copy. We yeah. need to talk a little bit privately about about the, the solid proposal that's in front of us on the on the increase, increase over two years. And then, um, then we will each get the, um, your proposal that'll look like we'll have a draft this yeah, or what have you. Right. And if we, what times do you have tomorrow morning? Eight? Um, eight thirty. What's, so are, you going eight. are you going back to your committee after the speech? We are. I mean, or are you well, going to finance? Is there a reason why we couldn't meet this, this afternoon? afternoon. This I think afternoon. that would be our I, preference. I can't be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Not even at 4.30? Or 5. We have a meeting at 5, and I have something at 3.30. Okay. Yeah, so. All right. Yeah, just wanted All right, to so see. All right, so I do it first thing in the morning. First thing in the morning. What's tomorrow morning? Wednesday? Yeah, we have tomorrow. 8.30 on the workforce development, but we could do 8, and we could push back workforce development until 9. Okay. That's not my preference. Okay. Okay. <laughs> could we do a wee bit later? Because I have an 8.30 that yeah. I'll skip, but... I, I mean, right now I have a hole in my schedule at 10 a.m. or we could meet at noon. Um, we I left do, my other. We, we, we don't convene until 9 o'clock. Not 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock. We're sharing pathways with the people's Great. So, yeah, I, I mean, 8. Well, that's not preferable. I'm for saying eight time. is not preferable to me. Uh, it's 8 not preferable for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it's just like it's nine, eight, nine, nine thirty, ten. Nine. So what but time do you have to? Do ten. What do you have? You have something at eight thirty. I, I can change it. I, I have so, the committee starts at eight thirty. Can't do eight thirty. Yeah. Could you yeah. do lunch, Mary? Yes. Okay. Well, why don't we just do lunch? Why don't we do twelve? Sure. I'm game with twelve. Okay, that's the default in case, unless it changes somehow. We always some, have that. We can always, <laughs> if we can find a sooner yeah. time, yeah. we'll do it. Yeah. Mary, what, this afternoon, if the governor goes to, what, when is it? 
in the next what should my, my committee has governor reps in at 3 30. 3 30. and then that will go easily until almost five okay. and then does the governor usually speak more than an hour oh i don't know but could we yeah, I would yeah, say maybe. 70 minutes is yeah. usually what you okay, could. Okay, so we couldn't say 3 o'clock. No. No, it seems too tight. Okay. No, I mean, we all have to wait to leave until the Senate so. We have noticed that that is not to get our due from the party. No, it's all okay. <laughs> We stop. Ron, we stop the plotting. Sure when we get copies of the whatever Damien gets to you. Of